Today we're diving into some awesome networking fundamentals, DHCP. Whether you're just getting into IT or you're an expert, understanding DHCP is super important. So what exactly is DHCP? DHCP stands for the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol and it's a network management protocol that automatically assigns IP addresses on a network to network devices and makes managing networks super easy and efficient. Because if we think about it just for a second, imagine how tedious it would be if we as IT administrators had to help each and every user get onto the network to connect their phones, laptops, etc. every time they came into the office. And then you also had to keep track of who has been given which IP address and that you do not accidentally hand out an IP address that someone's already using. It would be so annoying and tiring. I want you to think of the HCP as this really helpful IT admin who only has one important job. And that job is to help devices get onto the network. And they are even doing the job absolutely free, basically 24 seven, how generous. So what actually happens when a device without an IP connects onto the network? Well, something known as the DORA process or DHCP discover, offer, request and acknowledgement will occur where the host and DHCP server will exchange various bits of information to get an IP address. Let's do a bit of an analogy. So let's just kind of imagine this is like going to the restaurant, but you didn't book a table in advance and you need somebody to help you out because maybe you're silly like I am when it comes to stuff like anniversaries and you forget to book a table in advance, but you need to get into that restaurant and make it a special day. This is where a DHCP server might come in handy. So you'd go to the restaurant, you'd ask the host, hey, can you please help me? I don't have a table, I don't have a reservation, but I'd really like to get into this restaurant. Now this is where the host might say, hey, okay, let me quickly have a look and see if I have any available tables. They might go through a little book or they'll do a quick check through the restaurant. And if they see there's any available tables, which we might think of as an IP in this case, then they can say, hey, I can see there is action available IP. Here's what the, well, not IP, obviously. We can see there's a table. Here's the table information. This is table 35. Would you like to take this table? And then you as the guest can then decide, okay, I can see that the table looks pretty good to me. Yes, I'll take the table. So then you and your spouse or your family or whoever, you and your friends, business colleagues, whoever it is, you guys can go and have a seat at your new table and the host can then actually mark it off on their little book and say, okay, table 35, it's now been taken. It's now occupied by guests. So it can't be assigned to any other guests. Now that's kind of exactly how DHCP works as well with this whole Dora process. The server will kind of looks through its list of available IPs. It will find one, assign it and then mark it unavailable. And that's really the magic of DHCP. Now, if we want to get a little bit more technical and look at this at the way that the network might see it, they would just see a device that is plugged into the network, maybe via wireless an access point or maybe via a copper cable or something. And then this device will actually send out a broadcast message to the network to say, hey, are there any DHCP servers on this network? Can anybody help me? Help me find a DHCP or help me find an IP address? This is known as a DHCP discover. So in that whole Dora message thing, that is kind of what that D stands for, the discover message. Then as soon as the server actually picks up that the discover message has been sent out, it will then do what we know as a DHCP offer, where it will find the available IP address and tell that host, hey, okay, I can see what your MAC address is. I've got this IP address. I'm going to populate this packet with a little bit of information, like what your IP address is going to be. But what you need to understand is the server will then offer an IP address to the client. The client will then look at this IP address information and it will then request it, which is kind of funny because it's already done this discover and it's already been offered an IP, but now it's going to kind of confirm. It's going to say, okay, I can see this IP address. I like this IP address. I'm taking this IP address. Now that is a DHCP request message. And then lastly, in this whole process is where we have the acknowledgement, where the DHCP server will acknowledge that the IP address has been taken. And that's kind of where it marks it off of the list. So it doesn't send it out to any new clients that potentially connect to the network as well. And also kind of keep track of it with stuff like DHCP leases. Now that is really it. It seems really simple and it is actually super simple but it is also such a complex and cool thing that a lot of us take for granted, actually. Really, I know I take the HCP for granted most of the time. And that's just really scratching the surface. There's more things that you can do with the HCP. You can actually control how long the leases last. 
You can control exactly what DNS servers clients might get. And with the DHCP option specifically, you could even send out information like what is the SIP registration server to SIP phones, you know, like IP telephones, or you might even be able to send out controller information to access points because maybe an access point connects on, requests an IP via DHCP. You could even use stuff like DHCP options to let it know what its controller IP is. So it can automatically register to that controller and just start serving clients. That is so powerful. That is why DHCP is such a fundamental networking skill because there's so much that you can do with it. Now, I think we've spoken enough about DHCP. How about I show you how you can configure both a DHCP client and a DHCP server on your Microtech device. And I'll do this all via Live Lab so that we can just quickly run through everything. And this will kind of be like a blank configuration almost. So let's jump into it. So here's the lab. And let me just quickly log in via Winbox. I think I've already got a session open. It is just a CHR. And let me just quickly do a little walkthrough. We will have this Microtech device that will also act as a DHCP server to this little LAN network. And then we will also just have a connection out to the internet where we'll be a DHCP client, so to speak, where we will be looking for an IP address. Now setting up a DHCP client is actually super easy, straightforward and quick to do. So let's just quickly see how we can do that. So let me just log on to Winbox. And then from Winbox, what we can do is just navigate to the IP and DHCP client option. Now from the DHCP client, we can actually just click on the new button. And now we can specify exactly which interface we want to send those broadcast messages on. Where do we want it to find an IP address on? Now, if I look at my topology, I can see that my Ether1 is connecting to my actual virtual network in VMware. So this is just kind of how it's going to connect. So let me just quickly set Ether1 as the interface that the HCP client is going to run on. You can also specify stuff like use peer DNS, use peer NTP. It just kind of auto configures these details, what it can receive from the peer so that the Microtech will use it as its DNS server or time protocol server. Uh, you can also set stuff like add a default route. It does do it by default. It's just for that quick and easy access so that you can quickly get to the internet. And let's look at if there's any cool, interesting, advanced stuff. There is some DHCP options we can set. But for the most part, if you just want to obtain an IP address on the Microtik dynamically, you can just set up a client, specify the interface. It can be configured on VLANs as well. We'll see how we can do that in a later video. But let's just run it on Ether1. So I'll hit OK. We can see it is searching for an IP address. It actually found one relatively quickly. It's got a 30 minute lease on it. And we can see what IP address has been bound to the Microtech 192.168.140.138. Now, interesting enough, if I go into my IP addresses tab, we can actually see that there is a dynamically obtained IP with this D flag next to it in the IP address field. If I disable this DHCP client, you'll see the IP address actually vanishes. So that's pretty neat. That's pretty cool. So let's just quickly re-add it. Then we can see it's obtained 138 again. So typically a lease will be kept by the server so that that IP can stay on that host, even if they kind of vanish from the network for a little bit. This is kind of one of those cool things that DHCP does. But yeah, that's how we can do a DHCP client on the Microtech. So let's look at how we can configure the DHCP server on Winbox quickly. And it's actually straightforward. We go back into the IP menu, go into the DHCP server option or section. And from here, if we're in DHCP, we can actually run the DHCP setup wizard. If you're using the previous version of Winbox, it might be at the top in a tab somewhere. It might even be called the DHCP wizard. You can just click on the button, brings this nice pop-up. And the pop-up will ask you exactly, hey, on which interface do you want to run the DHCP server on? So kind of like on which interface is it going to listen for those broadcast messages to say I'm looking for IP addresses? This is kind of what that is. But it doesn't just do that. It's also actually going to use a lot of the information that you supply or that's already bound on that interface to kind of be pre-configured on the DHCP server quickly. I'll show you in a second. I just want to show you if I go back into my IP addresses, I have an IP 192.168.0.1 slash 24 bound to something known as my LAN interface. This is just a bridge with all of my LAN interfaces assigned to it. However, if you just had a single interface like Ether12, so if I look at my topology, Ether12 runs down to this virtual computer, then I would specify Ether12 as the address. 
So this is also where the power comes in. So if I go down and I take my interface, I want to run the DHCP server on, the moment I click next, it automatically creates the network as 192.168.0.0/24 because it found it on this IP address settings that I've already got set in my address list. So here we can see the network is 192.168.0.0 and it is a slash 24. So it's filled it in because of the information that's already bound to this interface. If I continue on, it's going to ask me what is the gateway going to be? And that is the Microtix IP address in this instance. It's going to tell guests, hey, your IP address as your gateway will be 192.168.0.1. If I continue onwards, it will give us an IP pool that we can assign. Now this is super useful because maybe you don't want the whole range to be used for DHCP. Maybe there are times that you want to statically reserve some IP addresses for clients that they can set up on their machines themselves or that you can give out to users. So here we can actually set exactly what the pool size will be. So maybe I only want to sign out from 192.168.0.50 dash, which is 2, 192.168.0.254. Now it's very worthwhile to note that with Microtik, whenever it, it assigns IP addresses from its pool, it actually starts from the very end and then works its way to the beginning. So some vendors do it from the start, some vendors start from the end. It's just one of those things. If we continue onwards, we can now select our DNS server. So in this instance, it's also just using my VM network settings as the DNS server, but I could use 9.9.9.9. .9 and if I wanted to add some more DNS servers, it's as easy as clicking on this plus and maybe I can use 1.1.1.1. And let's continue onwards. It'll ask you how long would you like the lease to be accepted. And by default, it is 30 minutes and 30 minutes is totally fine. However, maybe you're in some office environment and you know users will be at their workstations for much longer. So maybe you want to pump that lease up to something like eight hours. That's also completely fine. That's up to you how long you want the lease to run. Remember, this is just kind of like a reservation, how long the server will keep that IP address bound to that client. But it is worth noting that when a client actually, when its lease is about to expire, it sends out this whole process again to the server so that the server just renews the lease. It's kind of like when you go into your command prompt and you type in IP config renew, it forces that project or that process so that you just renew that IP address and keep that lease so that you don't lose the IP. Let's continue onwards. Actually, that's it. <laughs> that is it. That is how quick and easy it is to configure a DHCP server. So here we can see it's added this DHCP server here. And if I double click on it, there's a few extra settings we can see. Let's just close that. It is worth noting that if we go into the networks tab now, we can see it's filled in the networks with some stuff. Filled in what our address is what our gateway is, what our DNS service is. And you can see there's a few extra options you can tweak. Maybe you want to set stuff like a domain or your own NTP servers, or you want to set some DHCP options. Again, the options are really powerful if you're working with stuff like maybe printers or phones or even access points. Really, really cool stuff you can do with options. But most of the times, even myself, I'll go into Google and I'll Google these options to see exactly what the option code is and what value you need to put in for it to actually work properly. If we go to the leases, this is also where you can statically reserve an IP address to a MAC address so that the host can use DHCP. They can just plug in with DHCP, but the DHCP server will then always hand out this one specific IP address to them. So if I click on new, you'll see I might want to bind 192.168.0.49. I always want to bind this IP address to this specific MAC address. Now this is important that you need to know what that host MAC address is so that it always binds this IP address to them. You can set a few stuff like client IDs and all that stuff here as well. Just one of those useful things that you can also set. It is worth noting that when it picks up that a host connects, you can actually create a static MAC by clicking on this make static button once the host connects so that they always get that IP address as well. Really cool. If we go back to the topology, I'm just going to get this to do a, do a DHCP request so it can get that IP. And I'm going to see everything in real time, just doing a packet capture as well from Wireshark. So let's just quickly have a look here. I'm doing, going to do a capture against this host's Ethernet Zero interface. And once this capture starts, this is so cool. You're going to see everything in real time. I really love showing stuff like this as well. So it starts running and what I could do is just go onto this machine and I could type here IP DHCP. So it's going to request an IP address from the DHCP server. So hit enter. 
we can see it does a bit of this Dora process here. D-O-R-A, Dora, <laughs> there we go. So I can close this. We can see it, it shows it's got the IP address of 192.168.0.253 slash 24, and there's the gateway. But more interesting, if we go into this Wireshark packet capture, we can see this whole process. We can see everything that happened on the wire. How cool is that? And here we can see exactly there was a DHCP discover message. So basically a broadcast was sent out by that client to say, hey, I need an IP address. The server did an offer. And if we just scroll down and you can see everything inside this dynamic host configuration protocol offer inside this field. It's so cool. You can see everything in here. You can see exactly what IP address it's offering, what the gateway is going to be, what the lease time is. And then the moment it gets that offer to the host, the host can do that request where it says, hey, yes, I want to accept it. Here's my host name details. Here's a few other parameters from my end as well. And then finally, this DHCP server does the acknowledgement where it sends out the last bit of settings like the DNS servers and the router and all of this information. It sends it on, onto us. So we're finally on the network. And it's so cool because if I go back onto this virtual machine or this virtual PC, we can actually see that it has internet access out. I can actually do stuff like ping out to Google's DNS and I've got internet breakout. So that is really, really cool. So I think this covers what you should know when it comes to configuring a DHCP client as well as DHCP server on a Microtik device. There is definitely a lot more cool and interesting things that we will cover, especially again when we get to bridges. But this really encapsulates and showcases everything that I wanted to show you guys. I hope you've enjoyed watching the video and I'll catch you in the next one where we will be going into more awesome things where we'll actually be configuring everything from scratch again on a Microtik like it's our very first blank Microtik and we're going to bring it up onto a network and just make it work. So I hope you enjoy that. So thank you again for everybody for watching, especially the YouTube and Patreon members. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. See ya.